Welcome everybody to our next session on our final day here for our 39th annual conference for the Society for the Anthropology of Consciousness, Sea Change, Life Worlds and Ecological Upheaval. This is our 39th annual conference, but our first fully virtual conference. And it's been quite a time together so far and I anticipate that continuing now. This has been our most accessible, our most diverse and our uh, a conference with the smallest ecological footprint in the history of our organization. So we thank you all for being here, for participating and for help, helping to create and sustain this really unique and interactive and interdisciplinary container. Um, my name is Andy Gervich. I'm the president of the organization and I wanna greet you and welcome you as I have every session with a land acknowledgement. I'm speaking to you today uh, from a place that is now called Portland, Oregon but it rests on the traditional village sites of tribes such as the Multnomah, the Kathlamet, the Clackamas, the Chinook, the Tualat and Kalapua, the Malala, and many other tribes and bands. As the original caretakers of this land, we wanna begin our session by acknowledging their presence, their dignity, their continued struggle for respect, restoration, and reparations. Uh, we wouldn't be here if they weren't here first, and we wouldn't be here speaking to you today the way we are if they weren't displaced from this land. Uh, it is the goal of this organization to do our part to help rectify that. Uh, many of the sessions, including this one today, will in their own way uh, help speak to those issues. Uh, a little bit about functionality. Um, we are in a Zoom webinar again, and so um, only our speaker, who I'll introduce in a moment, will, uh, will have her camera on. And uh, she's gonna be reading from her text, uh, and I'll introduce Stephanie and her text in a minute. And we're gonna have Q&A kind of dispersed throughout. There'll be two or three sections throughout the reading where we'll open up a time for questions and answers. And so the best way to pose a question is to put it in the Q&A box. If you roll your cursor over the bottom of your screen, uh, your Zoom screen, you'll see towards the right-hand side, a thing that says Q&A. And if you open that, you'll be able to enter a question there and that keeps it in a queue in order and we uh, will be able to then deliver those to Stephanie at the time. Um, Another way to post a question is into the chat box and please do turn your chat box on now because we're, we'll be sharing information with you throughout the presentation in the chat box. Uh, information about this session, about upcoming sessions, about other aspects of conference functionality. Um, and use the chat box as a way to respond if you don't have a question per se, but you think of something and you wanna say something in response to the reading or communicate with us um, in ways that isn't a formal question, then the chat box is a perfect place for that. Because so much different information is gonna be coming through the chat, it might not be the best place for questions because we sometimes lose them because there'll be so much information coming there. But if you're more comfortable using the chat, uh, put your question there and we'll try to grab it and make sure that uh, we get it to Stephanie at those uh, correct times. Um, the other thing I'll say, and then we will get going here quickly, um, is that we have a transcription button. There's a button right next to the Q&A that says live transcript. And this is Zoom's AI transcri transcription. And so if you find having the transcription on, uh, having the captioning on, if that helps you interact with the session and understand and interact with the content better and you find that meaningful and useful, please do turn that on. It's not exact. It's an AI captioning mechanism. And so sometimes it can actually get some of the wrong, the words wrong. Some folks find that distracting. And so by all means, go ahead and turn that off or leave it off um, if, you, if you find that distracting. Okay, and so now uh, without further ado, over to our speaker. Stephanie Kane is a professor in the development uh, in the Department of International Studies at Indiana University Bloomington. And she's here to speak to us and read to us from a text that she's been working on uh, called An Engineered Tableau from the Spheres of Unintentional Agencies. What a wonderful title. Um, and I'm excited to hand things over to Stephanie right now. Stephanie, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Andy. I, I am happy to be here. I've been enjoying the conference very much and I appreciate folks for being here. You're kind of, I have no idea who's out there. It's just, um, I see Andy and myself. so. I guess that will make it to an, oh, now Andy's gone. Okay. Um, I am in Bloomington, Indiana. I'm doing, I'm writing about a place in um, Winnipeg, in Canada, Winnipeg, Manitoba. I've been working on this book for a few years. It's almost ready to go. Um, I have some selections uh, from the book to read for, for you. And 
Um, the working title of the whole book is uh, Furies of Wind and Wave, an Ethnography of Flood Control. So the, the engineer tableau is the title of the segment. Um, I actually have three segments. Uh, one is, the first one is an, an, a tiny introductory story that is me trying to speak in the voice of rivers. Uh, the second one introduces folks to the concept of spheres of unintentional consequences. And the third one enters into the realm of uh, multi-species ethnography. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank all of our ancestors um, and the indigenous people who preceded them here on our lands. Um, okay, so the story, if I, the ethnographer, could write like a river, a ventriloquist of moving aquatic form, I would send this communique to the human animals. I love to flow, to gather the rain into currents and pools, to explore earth and shapes, to lift boulders and crash broken limbs, to absorb water mo molecules into my river body, to defy gravity, to swell and push outside the root holding confines of my defining channels, to become a lake or a wetland seeping and teeming with fish and bird nourishing life. Like you human animals, I have my cycles and I and enjoy my secret deviances and dalliances as I rush, ebb, disperse, and share my soulful bounty. But you, your presence on this planet is new. Your geological time space is holocenic in extent, a mere 10,000 years, give or take. Yet your cities, your dense encrusted collectivities embedded in my prairie terrain, right up to my banks, fixing my flows with concrete and steel, damming and diverting my exuberance in spring. Yet now, after executing all this compulsion for control, you shy from the anger of elemental forces stirred by your lack of respect. Suddenly, you are apprehensive about the abstract conception of engineered balance that favors monumental systems over the ecology of beings too complex to fit within the spheres of your intentional logic and concern. Ha! This anthropogenic, anthropocentric, anthropocenic creation of yours, these cities that love to make my floodplains their home but hate to get wet, you cannot expect to live as long as I, who you call the Assiniboine, I who have outlived the Laurentian ice sheet. Although the ice sheet did melt into a freshwater inland sea, which shortened my path and turned me into a tributary of the Red River, a mere remnant of the ice age, though still an impressive urban actor that's way bigger than I. Red and I relate to your collective human animal forms as densely mobile, intra-acting beings with buildings, bridges, and a potential for the sacred. But you must realize that we cannot distinguish among you in your terms as individuals, families, communities, First Nations, Métis, settlers, immigrants, or any of the cultural identities that organize your 21st century everyday lives. If you have been listening, though, to your geoscientists, to whom I do sometimes pay uncharacteristic attention, you may be realizing your collective geological agency, your urbanizing forces to be as powerful as the lumbering and scraping glaciers who last resurfaced the continent and shortened my path. Why not stretch your imaginations and your technologies to find better ways to get along with us, the Assiniboine and the Red and with each other? Okay. Does anybody want to ask anything about that or should I continue into the main part of the text? Can I get some feedback? No, okay, I'll keep going. 
So um, we are watching, let me just have a larger screen. Okay, um, chapter one. Uh, geoculture in Manitoba. I, I use this term geoculture. I, I made up this term as far as I know to talk about the cultural dimension of um, human geological agency and how we experience the earth. And I also within that focus on geoscientists and engineers as actually engaging in cultural practice. So they think they're just all about technical stuff and science, but it is a cultural practice and they're, they are the way, the, the ones, the experts kind of shape uh, the relationship of cities and, and many of us to the planet. Okay, so um, here's the introduction. Flood events put everyday lives of inhabitants of river cities like Winnipeg, Manitoba in tension with water's impulsive, implacable elemental force. Yet whether in extreme disorder or in balance, cities and rivers share states of being. They are beings in tension. When rivers rise up out of their familiar channels to become freshwater seas, submerging landscapes of human habitation, then receding from neighborhoods left forlorn, they enact riverhood. When again and again, cities reshape themselves around flood prone rivers, they enact human collectivity. Impulses of rivers and human collectives, cities combine as they carry on being and becoming persisting in distinctive yet entwined embodied form. In this sense, water bodies and collective human bodies share in the planet's geophysical dynamics, which must also be geocultural dynamics as they move and persevere together. Cities and rivers enact a common impulse to sustain their distinct yet flexible forms. In the process, human intentions meet unpredictable events. I name the dimension of matter and meaning within which cities and rivers enact common impulses and within which events unfold unpredictably the spheres of unintended agencies. Flood control then can be defined as an intentional collective act to keep the city dry. In other words, flood control is the collective human effort to invent and sustain an altered state of being shared with rivers. Knowledge from expert fields of geoscience, engineering, and law, together with inhabitant experience, provide ethnographic material for telling flood control stories. These convey a geocultural imaginary with human and more than human actors who decipher, democratize, and re-enchant technical expertise for a new kind of appreciation. For the fact is, while technical flood control knowledge and its spatial logics seem straightforward and practical, intentions and effects can be out of sync for elemental reasons not always clearly recognized. Throughout this book, the sphere of unintentional agencies works like a touchstone a reminder to appreciate the impressive capabilities of flood control alongside a critical analysis of its assumptions, limits, and sacrifices. And to the sphere of unintended agencies where cities and rivers coexist in tension, but only humans act intentionally, provides an opening for attempting to tell socio-techno nature stories of water bodies as if they were as alive as you and I. To begin, I briefly sketch entryways into the geocultural imaginary. Um, oh, shoot, I forgot to share my screen. Um, this is a reservoir made out of the portage diversion by this dam. And it's in the province of Manitoba, about 80 kilometer, kilometers 
west of Winnipeg. So I'll just move to this. Um, this I, this uh, slide shows you what happened in the Ice Age, and I'm skipping over my scene where I talk about the Ice Age, but I wanted to put it here just to get you oriented towards the time frames, the space times of the this um, this work. So this is at the end of the Ice Age when Laurentian sheet, which had been covering most of North America, melted, all the rivers melted and came together in this low spot, which became Lake Agassiz, this gigantic lake. And it was hemmed in by the ice of the glaciers out of which it melted until four giant outbursts, it broke through the ice and this went to the Mackenzie River, this went out to the Hudson Bay in the Atlantic, this went out to the Mid-Atlantic, and this went out to the Gulf of Mexico. And those established the river systems that we live with today. And also, hypothetically, according to this geoscientific model, the currents on the planet were, were formed at that point because all this fresh water burst out into the salt water with gigantic impetus. So, that's the scale that I want us to start imagining ourselves as human actors, but I also want to start imagining us in relation to these beings that we cannot see. And this is a picture of a random diatom that I got off the internet. Um, and they are microscopic. They can best be seen with electron microscopes. So this is the, 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 the scales that go beyond our interactional scales, but yet we are acting within. Okay, so this is where we are now, the engineered tableau. So let's see. On the 27th of August, 2014, this is not quite your normal ethnographic scene. Roughly following the Assiniboine River upstream, I drive west out of Winnipeg across the prairie ac along Trans-Canada Highway 1, which is also Portage Avenue, to the Portage Diversion. And that's this structure here. This is the spillway of the portage diversion, and it's under the reservoir that was in that first picture. In continuous steady motion, water rushes through the giant concrete walls of the reservoir's spillway and fall into the churning riverbed below. A pelican squadron floats in a little side swirl of water between base and bank. Long orange bills plunge down and up into the air, throat patches full of deranged fish. Just downstream, a man fishes with a rod where line meets surface, a barely perceptible circle. On the grassy hill adjacent, a woman with small children play on a blanket. A stranger ethnographer stands apart, her camera silently shooting the engineered tableau. I see now as I write and as I speak, pelicans, man, family, my fellow spillway visitors teach me an early lesson. Monumental infrastructures of concrete and steel unintentionally offer sustenance and connection in ways that exceed engineers' intentions. For creating an excellent fishing spot is surely not an intentional effect of this multi-million dollar node in Manitoba's flood control system. Inside the fieldwork scene, but outside the city, I wonder about riverhood as impulsive entity and about the calm, pulsive discipline of river plus control structure, although I do not have yet have these terms in mind. Having prepared for this site visit, a cognitive map of the whole system mentally supplements my ground view. The dam spillway structure in the tableau is part of a larger assemblage called the portage diversion, a key infrastructural node in the provincial system. The portage diversion shunts floodwaters north to Lake Manitoba and away from Winnipeg to the east. Stuck in this relationship, the Assiniboine lives a hemmed in existence divided and diminished all year long, even when not flooding. 
Yet the river's impulses have power too. They continue to organize and motivate the spatial distribution of pelicans, people, fish, and two, determine the control structure's siting, design, and operational routines. An infrastructural question comes to mind. How are riverine impulses entangled with smaller mobile animal and plant bodies within the scene? The river buoys up the floating pelicans, parting its surface and splashing around them when they dive into the water between base and bank. Currents carry fish downstream to meet the hook of a man to meet the hook a man knots to the end of a line. Together, river unintentionally and man intentionally may trick fish into biting. Out of range of touch, family will presumably cook and eat caught fish, absorbing river water into their collective bloodstream. For her part, after contemplating the anthropogenic ground, dams set to allow river flow through the spillway, earthen banks sculpted to fit around control structure, mowed grass. The ethnographer carries the river away as digital imprints, later to choose one view among others to share with, with readers and listeners. Though due to financial constraints, the, well, this is referring to the book, the photos black and white rendering erases the sunlit river's muddy color. And here we are afforded that by Zoom, thank you. But there is so much more going on in this habitat of myriad living beings. Among the unseen, consider diatoms, opalescent single cell creatures invisible to the naked eye, but accessible if a limnologist or botanist collects, preserves, and prepares water samples for microscopic evaluation. Diatoms are ubiquitous in freshwater systems, although their species diversity is so specific, they can be used in forensic identification of locations where criminal suspects deliver corpses to the deep. The diatoms must have been there in the water and must also have been affected by river plus control structure. Imagine them, diatoms floating in the reservoir's calm layers near the top, collectively using their glass-walled bodies to turn sunlight into fish food until, oh no, some stray too close to the spillway and tumble willy-nilly into the churning river channel where, laden down by sediment, their work is interrupted until eventually currents carry them into Lake Manitoba, where quieter waters allow them to return to their biological, but also magical purpose. So um, this piece is about balance and level, ideal and measure. And balance is really important in so many ways to our discussion in healing and the anthropology of consciousness more generally, and also in science. And so in this piece, I'm trying to kind of sort out the, the different ways that that concept is used and exploited actually. So, oh, let me share my screen again. So this is Lake Manitoba, three or four years after a flood, you can see that the willow trees or the cottonwoods, I forget, are still drowned and that these big sandbags um, are still sitting in the water waiting for the next flood. And this picture in here is um, my drawing, but based on an engineer's drawing, the chief engineer of the systems about how wind pushes the water up um, over the banks of lakes, and that depends on the lake level. Okay, so on calm days, lake waters fill, quietly fill their beds, rising to unite shoreline inhabitants near and far. On calm days, their singular levels may inspire a sense of balance, of contemplation, Lake bodies offer a shared orientation and cultural coherence for those who gather beside them. When abstracted from the landscape, lake levels may also become a unit of measure. 
one that partakes of this sensory ideal, even as it serves as a practical reference, a baseline comparator for stormy days. For experts, lake level indicates how much water a lake might hold, a data point collected among others to use in the quest to find system balance. Water stewards set up gauges to track rising and falling levels. The numbers stream digitally, reflecting off lake surfaces up into satellites that beam them back down into office computer models. Oops. For engineers, lake level is the calculated balance between inflow and outflow, rainfall and evaporation. In the laws that support engineering, lake level provides a boundary and index range, a language for negotiating balance, and thus a technology through which the moving aquatic elements of lacustrine space can be governed. Um, okay, I'm going to cut away from all the technical stuff that follows and um, just read one more tiny paragraph and then come to talk to you. During this analysis, I find myself pivoting between lake balance and lake level as framing concepts. The balance frame captures this sense of things. Lakes are always in flux and always in search of balance. The search for balance, a basic feature of lacustrine geophysical nature, manifests and practically orients a poetic ideal of balance at the heart not just the flood control, but of social and environmental justice and indigenous tradition more broadly. The level frame captures another. The leveling action that lakes perform moves into legal engineering and popular floodways in curiously specific ways. Argument, calculation, and speculation following a flood revolve around the management and mismanagement and justification of physical lake levels. And in short, the, the province pushes all the floodwaters into Lake Manitoba, flooding people out there and in the north in Lake St. Martin, sacrificing the people who live and the creatures who live around the lake for the people in the city. So this is all determined in the language of balance and level. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Uh, Stephanie, this has been wonderful, and it's been everything we could have hoped for and more from you. And there's a comment in the chat from Mia Gover, and I just want to shout out to Mia. Mia is our brand new social media manager and has been doing an absolute wonderful job helping to promote the conference and all of your wonderful work on social media. And so thank you uh, for your great work, Mia, and thank you for being here. And Mia says to you, Stephanie, such beautiful poetic images. Thank you for sharing these works with us. Your photos are beautiful, but your writing alone is so evocative. And so we were talking beforehand, Stephanie, about we sit in these rooms and, and crank these, this language out and, and want to make something that resonates with people. And according to, to Mia here, your work is absolutely resonant. And, and so wanted to share Thank that. You, Mia. Thank you, Mia, for, for, your, for your thoughts and um, for your work. Uh, David Miller had he uh, froze up. He wasn't uh, he wasn't goofing on us. He, his computer froze up when we were trying to move him over, and so he put his question into the chat. And this is actually interesting because this came up. This is a question you asked, if I believe correct, uh, Stephanie, in our water panel the other night. And David asks, if you were to rename Lake Agassiz, what would it be called? And this is exactly what you were talking about the other day. So maybe speak to that a little bit in the the conundrum, as you put it, I believe, and the controversy around that, and, and even some of the answers the other day that people gave on, on how we can go about uh, this conversation and why that's so important, the naming of something like a lake like this. Yeah, I felt I really struck a wrong note at the end of that panel that was so beautifully talking about how we should build relationships with indigenous people. And I do think that should definitely be at the core of any process of renaming. But unlike a lot of the smaller lakes, Lake Agassiz is gigantic, right? It took up the, the whole heart, the whole interior of, of uh, North America from Canada and the United States. And so there's a lot of people, a lot of history, but Lake Agassiz happened before humans were there. It was ice and then melted. Um, and so what I like about the project of renaming Lake Agassiz beyond getting rid of the racist 
Agassiz from everybody's consciousness is, is that um, it forces us to think as geological actors and to kind of go beyond our existence on the planet to think about how we want to name something like that. So um, I think I'll just leave it there for now. Yeah, and uh, I'll just add, I don't think you struck a wrong note at all. Uh, that one of the great things about these conversations and bringing people in from different fields and different backgrounds and different lanes and approaches to this and having that water panel with some native activists and, and uh, you know, those of us who aren't from native communities in dialogue, uh, we have to sort of find each other and find ways to communicate. And I, I thought your questions were provocative and interesting and, and challenged us in this very conversation of, of um, you know, one of the panelists said something about like naming and renaming is great, but if we are only making symbolic changes only, that's not enough. We have to be changing the way we interact with these spaces and the way we empower the original inhabitants. But I, I found your comment to be part and parcel with that entire process. And one of the panelists brought up listening to the water um, itself to maybe tell you what it would like to be named. And although it's a very esoteric answer, I found it to be quite compelling. Uh, we have a, a question from Mark Shigoyan um, uh, speaking on the next panel and also uh, one of our board members. Mark says, your beautiful poetic prose, see there again, Stephanie, uh, reminds Mark, reminds him of the work of anthropologist and naturalist Lauren Isley. Has he been an influence at all on your work in writing? No, haven't read it. I guess I should. Yeah, I will. I'll look it up. Interesting. Maybe Mark, you can drop a few links into the chat. Uh, for uh, for folks, uh, especially of the works you're thinking of. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, other questions and comments, folks, please let us know. Stephanie, I have one for you. Um, you know, this conversation about water having consciousness or being consciousness and having agency, and I think we even talked in the panel the other night about uh, in New Zealand and other places, I'm starting to, to sort of name these bodies of water as as being individuals and so when legal decisions are made about damming them and using them that the 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 wellness of the body of water itself is actually taken into consideration it has a seat as a, at the table and, and can speak for itself so to speak in conversations about how to work with that water and i'm really interested in taking that to then your uh, discussion of flood control because it seems that, that that's a very human centric idea and when we look at water and how it how it hits um, a water table, um, water has a way it wants to move through spaces, and uh, sometimes that doesn't uh, line up with the way humans need to inhabit those spaces. And so then we have to start thinking about things like flood control. So how can we, from an anthropological standpoint, um, you know, still think about the way we have to inhabit spaces and work with water and work with the destructive capacities of it, without um, without caging it, without, without taking water and making it behave in ways that it doesn't want to, without moving it in ways and in places where it doesn't want to be. Does that make sense? Yeah, and it's of course our fundamental problem with, with both, both the destruction of rivers and climate change and all of that. Um, this is where for me, we have to look to the process of decolonization and environmental justice and water justice together because how this flood control system has evolved in, in, Canada, in Manitoba and I think Canada more generally and probably the world is that at the end of the 19th century, they used engineering uh, for flood control as, as, a, as a weapon. So they used it to protect and develop the city and took that water and, and diverted it and took whole river systems and, and moved them and directed that, that wrongness of all that water into First Nation um, and other indigenous communities. And so we have to unpack that and, and, and rewind that and um, have a process that's not really that different from, I think, the naming process. And maybe that could deepen the naming process by thinking about the engineering. Do you know of examples of people uh, that are doing it correctly? I brought up what folks in New Zealand are trying to do. I know that the Dutch have a long history of working with water in a way that, that, that tries to, to work with it uh, in their civilization. Are there, are there folks who are doing it correctly but aren't weaponizing 
the the manipulation of water, but are actually trying to work with it. I know that in my study of ancient civilizations, um, you know, uh, the Sumerians and others, as soon as you start to, you know, to divert the Tigris and Euphrates, you know, for agriculture, as soon as you start to, to um, upend the natural way water wants to move too much for human ends, you can get a, a great burst of activity uh, but then these unintended consequences, like you mentioned, and then a collapse. And so do you know of anyone uh, in places and communities that are doing this correctly? Well, th there are all kinds of um, projects going on. Um, and I started this whole thing when I was in Amsterdam and I went to Hamburg and th those two cities have some really great stuff going on. But I think on the whole, it's we're really facing this for the first time. And I think what, what I'm realizing is two things. One is that the, um, all our cities are built with 19th century engineering and that is bad engineering and it, it's, it's old, it's falling apart. It's not conceptualized for even our current situation and certainly not for climate change. And I have to say about the laws that are, my last book, Where Rivers Meet the Sea, is about activists who are fighting their governments to implement their own laws. So it's one thing to name something, and that goes back to the other question. Sure. One thing to name something. It's one thing to write a beautiful law about it. Um, and it's another to actually implement and enforce the kinds of laws that would protect our rivers from being diverted, from being polluted. Um, and I haven't seen any real progress <laughs> on that front. And I would love to hear about it if it exists. So there are these kind of small scale uh, attempts. And, and we're certainly at a moment where we know we, it has to happen. Someone on the panel the other day said, when we're working with people, we're working with water. And I think the, other, the opposite is true. When we're working with water, we're working with people and with ancestors, both human and non-human. Mm -hmm. um, where can folks get the book? How, how can folks get access to the book? <laughs> well, it's, it's, um, I have got to revise and resubmit. <laughs> um, and I, I'm putting finishing touches on it. So I don't have a, a contract yet. So it's going to be another year or so. Can um, folks follow your work or the stuff you're up to otherwise? Uh, I guess um, my last book, Where Rivers Meet the Sea, The Political Ecology of Water, speaks to a lot of the issues that we spoke to at this panel as well and what I'm dealing with here. This is kind of, I took the three major infrastructures that underlie cities, water infrastructure, so potable water, drainage, and um, sewage, and compared cities and port cities in Latin America and thought a lot of these themes about the agency of water in that book. So I guess I would refer people back to that and to just stay in touch with me. I just dropped the link for that book into the chat so folks can check that out. Oh, thank for you. those who don't know, um, we, some folks might not know this. If you go to your chat box and go over on the very bottom right, you'll see little three dots there and you can click on those three dots and actually download the entire chat, including uh, all the links and folks uh, both Tina and Mark Chagoyne were able to drop in some links and some references to uh, Isley as well. So I think that, that is fantastic. Stephanie, thank you so much for being here and sharing with us. This has fit, uh, any of your concerns about not fitting perfectly into our programming uh, were unfounded. You have fit right in here. You have a home <laughs> here. Anytime you wanna share your work with us, uh, we uh, comments from the audience, I think uh, reaffirm that we found the work to be captivating, to be poetic, to be engaging, to be from the heart and, uh, and, and just very, very moving and very enlightening. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, Andy, I really appreciate it. It's wonderful to be here and all of you out there in Zoom land. We are going to leave here in a second, folks, but then we have another session beginning at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. And with the time change, I know we're all still reeling to try to figure out what exactly that means. Uh, but uh, coming up, uh, excuse me, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. My, my mistake. See, again, I'm already making the mistake. 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 Pacific. So in 15 minutes, we will be entering into a panel discussion, Embodied Ecologies, Engaging the World Through Self. Uh, please do try to make it back for that panel. Margaret Brady, Cassandra White, Mark Chagoyan, and Susan Grimaldi will be there. And so it's going to be fantastic um, and a great continuation on this conversation and the, the, the energy that Gertrude um, got us started with today as well.
So thank you all so much for being here. We thank you again, Stephanie, for a wonderful reading. And uh, we will see you folks shortly on the other side. Bye.